More and more now, online extortionists trick boys and young men into sending intimate photos. They are looking to gain quick access to money. The fear of exposure unbearable. Well, who wants their parent to see a picture of their penis, right? Shame has pushed some teens to take their own lives. What were you feeling at that moment? But one found a way to fight back. So online watchdogs call this sextortion. They say reported incidents reached nearly 4,000 in one year. Katie Peterson breaks down the damage done and asks why social media platforms don't do more to rein it in. This is the main area of our tip line. Here at their Winnipeg headquarters, cyber tip analysts are seeing a stark increase in tips from the public for one particular kind of online abuse. Right now, we're averaging about anywhere between 8 and 10 um, sextortion incidents per day. Sextortion is the act of threatening to share someone's nude or explicit photos or videos publicly, in most cases for money. Hey, I have your nudes and everything enough to destroy you. If you block, I'll have no other choice than to send as I have a screenshot of all your followers. They're actually counting down saying, I didn't care about your life and career, bro. 19, 18, 17, 16, all in separate messages, and then escalating the threats. As you can see, the, the victim is really begging with them, like, please stop. CBC News has learned over the past 15 months, scammers have used Instagram and Snapchat to facilitate sextortion far more than any other messaging app. Most victims targeted are 14 to 24 year old males, and there's a reason for that. They are looking to gain quick access to money. Boys would be sort of their go-to because they're more impulsive, they're more likely, I guess you could say, to really engage in that sexual communication right off the bat. I imagine that they're not worried about their money. They want to get this money to this person. Well, who wants their parent to see a picture of their penis, right? It said, if you do not send me this money now, you will be exposed online. Two years ago, then 19-year-old Kyle, not his real name, got a demand for $500 after sharing an intimate video on his phone. He sent me a screenshot with over hundreds of friends and family that he was threatening me that if I don't send him more, that he will expose me. What were you feeling at that moment? My family members were all asleep and I was crying in my room and at that point, I felt very hopeless. Others have also felt hopeless, too hopeless to go on. 17-year-olds using Snapchat and Instagram, looking forward to graduating. 16 and 15-year-olds on WhatsApp and Facebook, barely into high school. All boys who won't reach adulthood because extorters played on their fears. What do parents need to know about sextortion? This isn't a parenting problem. We're confident that parents are really doing everything that they can to keep their kids safe. I think we really need to turn to um, looking at what these platforms, what their role is in these types of situations and what they could be doing to better protect kids on their platforms. The messaging app that Kyle used is called Kick. Created in Canada, now owned by Media Lab in the US, Kick is popular with teenagers because they can be anonymous, which also makes them a vulnerable target. They can create a fake email, make a fake age, and enter any group chat that they like. So imagine how many people under age are using these apps and are being exposed to this. Steven Sauer has been with CyberTip since its inception. He says he's reached out to platforms about what they could be doing to protect youth. We've talked about things like um, age verification, making sure that they have um, mechanisms to detect inappropriate conversations between youth and adults. How hard would that be for them to, to make changes? We know that they target advertising towards users of certain ages um, and age demographics. Um, so they obviously have that data. They, they gather as much as that as possible. Um, they just aren't utilizing it to safeguard the individuals. Is it even possible to not have these images being sent at the first place? At this school in the UK, they've got a plan to prevent sextortion. The whole idea is that through natural language processing, it is actually possible to identify when the conversation, which is an erotic conversation, is actually going towards blackmailing, right? 
So the, the whole fine line is not to intrude people's privacy, but to still actually raise an alert, raise a flag. Why isn't there that urgency on the part of the platforms to implement these into their systems? These companies are profit-making companies, right? So they will definitely put profit over public safety. We asked Kick, Meta, and Snap what they're doing to prevent sextortion on their platforms. Kick's parent company, Media Labs, says they're consulting with various organizations to enhance their protective measures. Snap and Meta said they've started rolling out safeguards that can make it harder for strangers to contact teens. And Meta also says they have a notification system that warns teens when suspicious accounts contact them. Snap says they're beginning to issue similar warnings. But with nearly 4,000 reports of sextortion in the last year, experts say these measures are just not enough. And it will take regulation to ensure all the platforms bring in effective preventative measures. There's no liability for companies that operate a tool that allows youth to be victimized on that platform. Um, they are not responsible for that in any way. And so I think regulation is, is kind of the key to this um, at this point. For Kyle, he decided to fight back. He used his extorter's money transfer details to track down their country in real name, which scared them off. You can choose to stand up and no matter what the consequence, know that there's still going to be someone in your life that's going to support you. Cybertips advice, reach out for help and report it. Block them, don't communicate, don't pay the money is really important because we know from experience that the threats don't stop. So Katie, we saw some calls for regulation there, uh, but what's actually happening? What's the Canadian government going to do? Well, several ministers are working on legislation that aims to make the internet a little bit safer for Canadians. Um, but they have been working on that since 2020. Mm -hmm. Now, the Minister of Justice, Arif Farani, told us in a statement that sextortion is on his radar as he continues these consultations. But he didn't give us any information about the timing or when we might see these regulations come into fruition, except to say that it's too important to rush it. All right, Katie Peterson, thanks for your work. Thank you. So as you heard Katie say, if you're a target of sextortionists, you really should report it. Go to cybertip.ca. And if you're having thoughts of suicide, there is help available 24 hours a day. Call 1-833-456-4566. Or you can text 45645 between 4 and midnight. Coming up, Qatar has already played a role in the release of hostages from Gaza, but it is also home to the leaders of Hamas. One question to ask is whether the United States wants an ally like Qatar to be hosting Hamas. Why Qatar's role in the war doesn't sit well with everyone, we'll break that down next. woman lives in stark fear as Israeli airstrikes hammer Gaza. I think tonight is the night we're all gonna die. Her immediate goal, survival. Every night we think it is our turn. Her faint hope, escape. Shukha Najjar says she's with about 150 people, including her mom and other family, all jammed into three apartments. Her father and brothers anxiously waiting in Edmonton. Here's part of her conversation with Susan Ormiston. Hello, Shoot, this is Susan. Hi, Susan, how are you? Uh, more importantly, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm still alive. You're still alive. How are you surviving? Uh, so it's a, tr a struggle. The running water and the drinking water, this is so hard to get. Um, of course, there's no electricity at all. We try to charge our phones, like uh, using the car batteries. If I get my phone charge 20 percent that's a that's a win yeah are you afraid you're going to be hit you know the mental and moral situation is uh, devastating finding water and, and food it's not a concern for us as much as staying alive and making sure that our family are okay especially the two nights that we were completely cut off these were the most difficult two nights we were really disconnected. We couldn't get a hold of anyone inside of Gaza or outside. We had no uh, access to news. 
We could just hear bombing airstrikes all night long. Some are very close. We could just hear the, the house shaking. We could smell the, the dust. We were like, okay, this is the end. I think tonight it's the night we're all gonna die. Every night we think, you know, we are gonna get hit. It is our turn. And where are you living right now? I, I fled my home. I, I live in Gaza City with my husband. Um, but now I'm staying in, in, in Khan Yunis, it's my grandma's and uncle's place. We have at least 150 people with us, their relatives and friends. It's a three apartment for three families, but now we have maybe like uh, 20 families or so. Where are you finding any hope? After more than three, three weeks, being stuck in this nightmare, I completely lost hope. I I even lost hope in humanity. I don't I don't understand how this is still happening and it's still going and, and no one is able to make an end to this. When I sit with my mother we talk, I just think, well maybe this is the last talk I'm gonna have with my mother. So no, I don't have hope. Shukal Najjar says the Canadian government has told her it's working with partners to try to arrange safe passage for Canadian citizens in Gaza. Far away from that strife, top Hamas leaders are living in luxury in Qatar. But where it gets complicated is that the tiny Gulf state is also a Western ally. Thomas Degla breaks down Qatar's curious role as a wartime mediator. Somewhere amid the pristine streets and all the skyscrapers, Doha has an open secret. Qatar's capital city, 1,800 kilometers away from Gaza, a comfortable home for the leadership of Hamas. That's the group's political chief, Ismail Haniya, personally labeled by the U.S. a specially designated global terrorist. But living in Qatar, he greets allies like the Iranian foreign minister in full view of the cameras. For years, he and other senior Hamas leaders have been holed up in Doha. And now, more than ever, that deal has come into question. In Qatar, Hamas's political leadership is closely scrutinized and closely watched. The fact that they are harboring the bin Ladens of this story is unacceptable. Since the October 7th massacre, Qatar has positioned itself as an intermediary, helping to free Israeli hostages. But this story starts much earlier. In 2012, the Hamas leader, Hania, and Qatar's then ruler stood hand in hand. The group, already designated a terrorist organization by the US and Canada, was welcomed and set up its political office in Doha. Has there been a, a benefit to having Hamas's political office sort of out in the open right there in Doha? I think right now you'd have to say it definitely is a benefit. Um, it's a controversial benefit. Uh, it's definitely one that has uh, raised some eyebrows and some anger. The tiny state, mega wealthy from natural gas, plays an outsized diplomatic role with the West. Designated a major non-NATO ally by the US, Qatar last month helped secure the release of American hostages from Iran and earlier hosted negotiations between the Trump administration and the Taliban. Kristen Dewan is a scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Given that they're kind of insecure about their position, a lot of times they've tried to build relations with a number of different parties all across the region. And they've also seen it as very helpful to be able to play this mediating role. Um, throughout all this time, it's important to say that they've always maintained their very close ties with the United States. But plenty changed when Hamas militants stormed into Israel and took 1,400 lives. Within days, the U.S. Secretary of State was meeting with the Qatari Prime Minister, and Antony Blinken made this pointed public comment. There can be no more business as usual with Hamas. Murdering babies, burning families to death, taking little children as hostages, these are unconscionable acts. Then, at the United Nations, Israel's foreign minister, Eli Cohen, berated the Qataris, demanding diplomats pile pressure on the Gulf autocracy. Qatar, which finance and arbor of Hamas leaders, could influence and enable the immediate and unconditional release of all 
of all hostages. But it's complicated. Israel has mixed feelings about Doha. The Prime Minister's national security adviser posted on social media, Qatar's diplomatic efforts are crucial at this time. And Qatar's Prime Minister insists hosting Hamas has proven useful. As long as we are keeping the communication open right now and focusing on putting an end for this conflict and this is useful, that's, uh, that will remain our main focus. Indeed, Doha brokered talks that led to two hostages being freed at first, then another two last week. Qatar purportedly exerts influence over Hamas by helping to fund the civil service in Gaza. This is not new. We found a transcript from 2014 when U.S. Congress called Qatar perhaps the largest financial patron of Hamas. Which leads us back to this. The way the Qataris pull this off is by whitewashing their role in supporting Islamic extremism by supporting businesses and investing vast sums of hydrocarbon wealth across places in London and the United States and elsewhere. Mark Wallace served as a U.S. envoy to the United Nations under George W. Bush. He now leads the nonprofit Counter Extremism Project. They're demanding a boycott of Qatar's luxury properties abroad, like London's famous Ritz Hotel, sold in 2020 for more than a billion dollars to the brother-in-law of Qatar's ruler. What are the chances they are not going to be financially and uh, and uh, personally? and as a government liable in part, in part for these terror attacks. The perpetrators of these acts are hiding in plain sight, not even hiding, hosted in plain sight in luxury. Doha has now reportedly agreed to review its relationship with Hamas after the hostage situation is resolved. But some have concerns, like Professor Mehran Kamrava at Georgetown University, Qatar. We reached him in Doha. One question to ask is, whether the United States wants an ally like Qatar to be hosting Hamas, or does it want a country like Iran, Syria, or even Hezbollah to be hosting Hamas? In that situation, what would that mean for the U.S. and the West? I think it means a further radicalization of, um, of Hamas and an inability to keep tabs on them. Hamas isn't leaving yet, with senior leaders comfortable a world away from Gaza, under global scrutiny more than before. Qatar's foreign ministry is warning that the latest strikes on Gaza undermine efforts to mediate and de-escalate. Coming up, an Ontario father goes above and beyond for his son. The smile on his face, I think that's the main thing. Could this be Canada's best Halloween costume? That is next in our moment. Maybe, just maybe, you remember Easton Oding and his Zamboni costume from our moment this day last year. We didn't think anything could possibly top it. That is until we saw his fire truck costume this year. So with working lights, a siren, a water gun, Easton's family continues to make every effort to put a smile on his face. And that love now is our tradition. It's our moment. Easton's got a super rare genetic disorder. He's unable to walk. So we built a Halloween costume around his wheelchair. Easton! <laughs> we did the uh, hot dog stand, the grandpa from up, the skid steer, and then the big one, the Zamboni. The Zamboni went completely viral. Once the NHL posted it, we actually got to meet Connor McDavid in person. He was an incredible person when we met him, just super down to earth, nice guy. So I knew I had to step my game up for this year's costume. I think I did fairly well. <laughs> we got the working lights, it's even got a siren on it. Do you have a working water gun? It's pretty bum. No! <laughs> Starting a fire hall. They invited us down to play with the fire hose. And it was absolutely incredible. He used to love the, he loved the big fire trucks, but I think he actually likes sitting in his a little bit more. The smile on his face, I think that's the main thing that tells how happy he is. Good job, DJ and Easton. A little tip for you. Why a fire truck? Well, to put out the flames, because, of course, he's an Oilers fan. For all of us here at The National, thanks for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app. Subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.